feeling, then he's justified in that. Because uh, despite uh, his uh, book uh, published in 1985 and all the uh, subsequent work that he uh, had done uh, to uh, promote the vision of molecular machines, uh, despite all that and half a trillion dollars in R&D spent on nanotechnology, we still don't have molecular nanorobots today. And um, uh, the reasons for that are many, and some of them were discussed uh, in uh, Eric Drexler's uh, 2012 book, Radical Abundance. But uh, briefly, uh, it is uh, related to political reasons and uh, to uh, complexity of uh, the nanorobot idea. Uh, Eric Drexler said uh, that um, molecular machines and atomically precise manufacturing uh, may end up being uh, the fourth great revolution after the agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, and uh, information uh, and communications revolution. And um, what, we, uh, what we want uh, to achieve uh, is uh, machines uh, that operate uh, at the atomic level and uh, machines that have structure uh, that is uh, atomically precise. And um, uh, at this moment, uh, most scientists, uh, even uh, Nobel Prize winners, uh, are not uh, very familiar with uh, how molecular machines might operate. Uh, on this slide, you can see uh, a copy of an image that was uh, presented by one of the Nobel Prize winners a couple of years ago. And uh, he was uh, uh, being given the prize uh, for some molecular related things. And uh, he wanted to present a vision of the future, a vision of uh, molecular machines that one day will roam inside our blood system um, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, help solve uh, some diseases uh, and, and uh, do things like that. But what we see uh, on this image? On this image, we see uh, a collage uh, that is uh, presented as to be a 3D reconstruction of uh, several objects. And these objects are not to scale. What we see here are red blood cells and then next to them are molecular nanotubes. Molecular nanotubes uh, should actually be uh, like a uh, hundred uh, or a thousand times smaller than they are here. And then there are uh, some uh, molecular constructions which are actually proteins connected to this um, uh, to these um, nanotubes. And this is impossible, obviously, because proteins are uh, tens or hundreds of times bigger than, uh, than nanotubes. And uh, what we also see are some strange uh, lines, which uh, apparently are legs or maybe flagellas uh, connected to these nanotubes, uh, which is impossible because they would literally be one uh, atomic uh, bond uh, thick and uh, there's no way uh, something like that can exist or even function as a leg. So what we see is a person, a scientist who is a Nobel Prize winner, so he's extremely smart and qualified, but even he, uh, even 30 years after nanotechnologies were proposed, has no clue as to uh, what uh, nanorobots uh, should look like. And this is, I think, uh, one of the key problems um, for molecular nanotechnology. Uh, it's not just that uh, politicians made mistakes or some people wanted to uh, get the money from grants and venture funding. It is that uh, we humans and uh, our scientists do not have a conceptual understanding of what nanomachines made from individual atoms would look like. And this is what I wanted to solve. Um, if, we, uh, uh, if we look at uh, the positive side uh, that happened uh, uh, in terms of uh, nanotechnology promotion, uh, we know that many politicians were very supportive uh, and very serious about uh, molecular nanotech. For example, Albert Gore, who was uh, a congressman at that point, um, he arranged for hearings um, in the uh, Office of Technology Assessment uh, in Congress, and he invited Eric Drexler, who presented uh, his ideas about nanotechnologies just six years after his book was first published. And uh, he, Albert Gore requested that uh, political proceedings start um, on nanotechnologies, and eventually, after about 10 years, that led uh, to the creation of a nation non-technology initiative, which unfortunately uh, did not um, unfold as it was uh, originally planned. And uh, these problems uh, of implementation, of political implementation, they repeated in all countries. Like in Russia, 10 years after that, um, in uh, 2011, 
um, uh, Dmitry Medvedev uh, was uh, inviting Eric Drexler to Rosnana Forum, and uh, he was uh, saying that uh, Drexler is a legendary scientist, and uh, he was extremely respectful of him. Uh, but uh, Rosnano, a Russian nanotechnology company created uh, at that point, uh, did not develop molecular nanomachines either. So uh, I think that uh, there are serious issues with political implementation, yes. But the biggest uh, issue is that we do not uh, envision, we cannot visualize uh, molecular machines. And uh, the solution to that, uh, in my view, can be um, uh, molecular construction in virtual reality. And that's what the NanoLab project is about. Our main idea with this project is to bring the vision of atomically precise manufacturing back to the popular imagination, make it uh, realistic, uh, help create some conceptual uh, models and ideas, uh, make ideas uh, real uh, of what nanomachines can be so that uh, we can have this nanotechnology revolution 2.0 that hopefully will be more successful than the first one. Um, I think it's impossible to build and design nanomachines without uh, design software. Uh, and um, we don't currently have many images of uh, nanorobots uh, online. We have maybe like several tens of uh, renderings, uh, maybe a hundred, and um, none of them are realistic. None of them reflect uh, uh, what it is like uh, to build uh, on a molecular, on an atomic level. So uh, we need to proceed forward. And um, the uh, key approach that we chose is we can uh, create an interactive virtual reality simulator where uh, users can operate uh, individual atoms uh, with their own hands. And uh, these atoms would behave uh, realistically, uh, not as uh, macro scale objects, but as uh, real atoms that interact according to quantum chemistry. Uh, if we can successfully do that, uh, this um, allows for design uh, of um, molecular structures and uh, nanoparts uh, that is consistent with uh, chemistry, that is consistent, uh, consistent with reality, but uh, at the same time, it doesn't require uh, computer, uh, doesn't require special equipment uh, to synthesize these uh, structures in reality. And in this way, uh, we can move forward uh, to more and more complex uh, devices um, while at the same time uh, making it uh, accessible to uh, even young users such as students. Uh, what we uh, we done uh, what we've done with this prototype, um, which uh, actually work uh, works, and uh, you can. Uh, uh, download and run a nano lab if you have a virtual reality helmet such as uh, HTC Vive or Oculus Rift uh, is we tested it with uh, children and um, we found out that it's very easy for them to grasp their idea of uh, operating uh, with individual atoms and it's uh, just as easy as using uh, Minecraft software or uh, Lego uh, uh, con construction kits. And um, uh, this, I think, uh, is very important uh, to, it's, it's very important to lower the barrier uh, to uh, interactive design so that uh, people who are not 3D designers, people who are not scientists, uh, can still um, create uh, something, uh, even if it's as simple as a water molecule, uh, H2O, uh, and then they can proceed to more complex stuff. So, uh, this is uh, the basic concept. And um, uh, the reason I think uh, it can be uh, very useful is that uh, even uh, at the level of very simple molecular structures, uh, there is huge potential for uh, breakthroughs. For example, if you look at the Nobel Prize in Chemistry from 2016, you will see uh, special molecules called uh, catenins uh, that are depicted on the right. And these molecules are actually uh, several rings, such as uh, two rings depicted here, that are connected uh, geometrically. So uh, this is an example of a structure which is not uh, created using just covalent bonds, but uh, which consists of two parts that can move uh, relative uh, to one another, but at the same time, uh, that can be uh, quite easily uh, designed and uh, built interactively, even by uh, somebody 
like who is uh, just a school uh, uh, student uh, and just starting to learn chemistry. Uh, and um, the, if you can have children uh, creating uh, new uh, original results uh, that have scientific value, that means we can uh, attract a lot of attention uh, to the field of uh, nano design, nano engineering, and uh, then we can have people competing uh, when they create uh, more complicated structures, such as uh, simple uh, nano cars, uh, structures that can move uh, on the surface, uh, structures that have uh, interactive moving parts. And uh, step by step, we can move towards uh, the vision of Eric Drexler, the vision of molecular machines. And the benefit of doing this on a computer interactively is that uh, we can sidestep all the difficulties uh, related to actual synthesis and uh, the fine tuning of uh, uh, experimental work. Because uh, usually when you are doing uh, nanotechnology research, uh, you can spend a year or even two years just making sure that your experimental setup works. And that is not very productive when we think about long term uh, design and uh, when we want to design something complicated. Uh, here we make a step up from complex in complexity from catenance um, to something um, which is a mechanical uh, nanocomputer. What you can see here is design created by Robert Freitas, uh, one of uh, uh, non-technology pioneers and a supporter of uh, Eric Drexler. And uh, this computer, uh, you can see um, the logical structure is on the bottom, uh, on the uh, top right uh, is how it looks uh, atomically, and on the uh, top left you see an image of a particular uh, rotating part, uh, which uh, forms a part of this uh, logical uh, uh, logical unit, logical processing unit. And um, if you combine many units like this, uh, you can have um, uh, mathematical operations such as addition or, or other operations performed mechanically. So uh, these parts rotate uh, uh, relative uh, to one another uh, and you don't need uh, electric signals to be sent. Uh, and this allows a much higher density than traditional electronic computers and uh, much better performance. So this is something which is realistic. It may not work in reality 100%. It may need some tweaks once we move to uh, actual production, but uh, it is realistic enough uh, to be valuable. And I think that uh, when uh, we make a design uh, of nano machines uh, popular enough, we can have many developments like this. Um, and you just need to look at examples of Minecraft and Roblox to see how creative people can be in virtual worlds uh, to envision uh, what can be done. So uh, we want uh, to move this uh, uh, software uh, to, system, uh, to schools. Uh, we want uh, to make it available online uh, via Oculus and Steam VR platforms so that uh, as many people as possible can try uh, designing uh, structures of from individual atoms and then share these uh, molecular parts and then have competitions and uh, uh, collaborations. Uh, there are some um, projects such as Nanom AI, uh, which are similar uh, a little bit. Uh, and uh, uh, the good thing is that we have uh, a big, uh, uh, a big number, large number of uh, virtual reality headsets uh, already um, available and many people are interested in that um, uh, and uh, oh, even many schools have virtual reality hardware uh, so uh, this means uh, the time may have come for VR to be uh, to be popular and uh, to be uh, useful. Um, in addition to this VR interface, uh, what uh, we've done in our project is we created our own uh, simulation uh, software uh, to interactively uh, simulate uh, inter uh, behavior of molecules and atoms. And it works uh, much faster than existing um, simulation algorithms. Uh, it uh, is not 100% accurate, but it's accurate enough uh, for practical purposes and for design of molecular machines. And um, the great thing is that uh, it allows you to work uh, in 
an interactive mode so that uh, you can have a structure of uh, hundreds of atoms, thousands of atoms, and you can move uh, individual atom and the entire structure will be updated uh, and uh, even chemical reactions uh, can be uh, simulated as well. Uh, unlike in many existing software products uh, where uh, only molecular dynamics is simulated, but what happens when two molecules uh, interact, um, they don't simulate that. So. Uh, we want uh, to uh, put this uh, algorithm uh, also in the VR uh, constructor, in the VR simulator, uh, so that um, our interactions with molecules are as realistic uh, as feasible. Uh, once we um, uh, complete some work um, uh, on uh, individual molecular parts, we can move forward. We can um, have different software packages uh, that are uh, complete uh, computer-aided design uh, CAD uh, systems, and then we can start creating uh, more complex machinery. Here uh, is an illustration that um, it's already possible to simulate on a computer an entire factory. Here you have an illustration from an Airbus factory, and uh, there was a recent announcement from NVIDIA, which uh, has done a number of projects in car manufacturing. So uh, if we can, um, model uh, an entire factory on a computer, uh, that means we can model an entire nanofactory on a computer. And it's uh, not more complicated uh, than a macro scale factory. So that means uh, once we are done with uh, molecular parts, uh, once we have uh, tools to explore the potential interactions of molecular parts, we can then design uh, a factory or uh, a nanorobot, uh, which is uh, similar in complexity. and. And uh, then we'll have a, a conceptual design of a first molecular machine. So uh, that's uh, basically uh, the goal. And um, uh, we believe that uh, it can be done um, uh, quite soon. Uh, I think that uh, it can take maybe two or three years uh, to move uh, from where we are now uh, to uh, a big shared library of um, Nano nano machinery designs and uh, some collaborations of uh, students, uh, engineers, nano researchers, etc. And uh, after that, uh, it may take five to ten years, uh, depending on the funding, uh, to actually uh, set up um, a production pipeline that allows. Uh, gradually to build these uh, structures uh, and have them running uh, in, uh, uh, real, uh, uh, in real atoms. So that means uh, that um, the timelines that were proposed by Eric Drexler and his colleagues uh, decades ago, that nanotechnology can be developed in 10 to 20 years, are even uh, more realistic right now. And we can be optimistic that uh, in uh, like, five to 10 years, we can have molecular machines uh, once uh, we have first uh, visualizations of uh, what they can look like and how they might work. So that's uh, the vision uh, I wanted to share with you. And uh, I want uh, to say that we owe uh, a lot of gratitude uh, to Eric Drexler, who uh, gave us this vision of a future productive revolution. and. Um, uh, I also have to admit that uh, currently he's not very much involved with nanotechnology. After he published his book, Radical Abundance, he moved to Oxford uh, to Future of Humanity Institute, where he's currently focused on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, mostly not nanotech. And I think that's a huge uh, disappointment for us. Uh, and uh, understandably, that was a huge disappointment for Drexler that uh, we didn't uh, work well enough uh, to realize his vision. But I believe that we still have a second chance and uh, I hope that uh, uh, we will see it become reality. So thank you very much uh, and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Thank you everybody to come. Uh, you can uh, either, uh, write your questions in chat or unmute yourself. And if there's any uh what do you need daniel what do you need uh, for the next stage of uh, uh software development well um we uh 
need um, an educational partner. That's uh, the first thing. So we need uh, a company or an organizational group, uh, like government organization maybe, that would um, support um, uh, deployment and testing uh, of this software. Uh, I believe that um, education is a better path than uh, nano-research because we are not competing uh, when we are teaching uh, children chemistry. Uh, we're not competing with existing solutions and with other interests. Uh, and uh, we also need uh, some people who are uh, experts uh, in um, uh, quantum chemistry uh, to have a look uh, on the NDA, of course, uh, to have a look at our algorithms to check that uh, our simulation software uh, works correctly. We've done our, uh, the tests ourselves, but um, uh, we haven't published this uh, uh, in a scientific journal, so we want to do some testing first. So that's the second thing that uh, could be useful. Thank you, thank you. There's a question from, uh, uh, I think, uh, Alexis Fagan. Uh, how do you plan uh, on synthesizing these nano machines once they're designed? Can you elaborate on that? Okay. Um, one of the participants in the project, Alexander Alikevich, Russian non technology pioneer, has uh, a free uh, stage uh, strategy uh, how we can move uh, towards. Uh, uh, nano fabrication. We first start uh, uh, in uh, at the micro level. Uh, there is already uh, a lot of work done uh, in um, uh, micro fabrication uh, from silicon and from other materials. So we can create this uh, MEMS uh, mecha uh, mechanic. Uh, uh, basically, uh, microstructures that can. Uh, work uh, mechanically. And then we can move uh, two steps further down uh, and uh, eventually build something uh, from individual atoms. An alternative approach is uh, to use uh, existing technologies such as DNA origami that Eric Drexler, for example, advocates uh, to build uh, the scaffolding for nanomachines uh, and uh, synthesize uh, small parts using organic chemistry. Another approach is we can use um, existing uh, 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 atomic force microscopes uh, or tunneling microscopes uh, uh, that uh, can be used to move individual atoms that has been demonstrated in the laboratory. And uh, I believe that uh, if we know, uh, if we can design a sequence of these mechanical operations uh, in software, then we can use existing uh, a atomic force microscopes uh, to uh, actually repeat these movements uh, in reality. So uh, we can have um, uh, basically a base layer uh, of inert atoms on which we can press, uh, put uh, one carbon atom uh, using this uh, positioning tool. Then we can move a second one, the third one, uh, the fourth one, and uh, we can potentially build a very large um, number of possible structures using just these mechanical operations. And uh, uh, that would uh, create uh, the first parts uh, for nano machines. Um, I believe that uh, I've sent uh, some of the materials to Robert Freitas uh, and maybe to Marco too, but uh, I haven't got a response from him. So, and um, <laughs> It's not clear. I mean, uh, Robert Freitas is active uh, in uh, molecular design. He has some recent patents uh, published uh, uh, for uh, molecular computers. Uh, Eric Drexler is, as far as I know, not um, active himself. He is consulting for some projects, uh, but not uh, pushing this forward himself. Uh, as regards to Ralph Merkel, um, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, he is the, basically the third guy. And I mean, uh, it was actually a conversation with Ralph Merkel and Robert Freitas uh, in Stanford about 10 years ago, where I asked them, uh, what's the problem? Why are there no molecular machines? And uh, they said, uh, I think it was Robert, Ralph Merkel who said, uh, that's the reason is uh, the lack of software for designing uh, nano machines. And uh, I remembered that uh, 10 years ago. And then uh, after I got back to Russia, uh, 
uh, we gradually started uh, working in this direction and the nano app was born out of that and out of that conversation. So that's actually something that can be traced to Ralph Merkel. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, uh, can you please type your contacts uh, in the chat so everybody can copy if they need more elaborate answers and uh, um, well yeah another question would either of you be interested in working with someone in idea to create nano machines using or the organic chemistry dna origami approach when you want? Uh, yes, I think uh, especially organic chemistry is something that can be uh, compatible with uh, the nano web strategy. Uh, we believe that uh, our simulation algorithm will be uh, feasible uh, for uh, small scale uh, organic uh, molecules, uh, not for DNA, uh, not for big proteins, but for some simpler stuff. And uh, yes, uh, it's very interesting how you can uh, design uh, some molecular machines using parts uh, which can be synthesized uh, using organic chemistry approaches. So that's um, uh, a very interesting strategy that uh, we would be interested uh, in exploring. And I hope that some of the users will also work on that. Well, thank you, Daniela. I hope everybody's uh, wrote down uh, his contacts for more information for for the follow up. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming. And Can I uh, ask one more question? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So I, I think the idea of this software for for educational purposes, I think is it's great. <laughs> I mean, that would really help teach chemistry. But you know the capabilities compared to what already exists for much larger systems, uh, not really that good. <laughs> and uh, with nanotechnology and nano machines, the, the main issue is not really ability to build molecules. You can do that very well already. It's 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 a lack of ideas, <laughs> um, and uh, including the lack of sound sound science behind uh, some of these utopian ideas. So and there were some statements in, in, in this presentation that are not true. Nano robots already exist. <laughs> but you know, how do you tame them and make completely uh, useful robots for nanoscale production? It, 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 it is not limited by the lack of design tools. They would definitely help, but you know, in the 30 years, people created protein-based nanostructures, DNA nanorobots, and many nanoparticle-based robots. It's, it's a lack of really advantages of this approach compared to something like self-assembly. Daniel, are you here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, uh, I've been uh, reading a lot um, uh, about uh, how people can work uh, with uh, molecular design. And um, uh, my answer is that um, you probably need something like um, engineering uh, intuition or technical intuition uh, for people to be good designers. And um, uh, you and I and everybody else already has good uh, technical intuition in, in regards to like things like glass, metal, wood, paper, uh, you know how a glass behaves uh, when you drop it on the floor. You know how paper behaves. Uh, but um, even experienced chemists, uh, they don't uh, usually have, I mean, some of them might, but uh, many people who work in chemistry, they don't have good technical intuition um, uh, related to uh, molecular interactions. And some of that uh, we've seen uh, when uh, people created uh, multi-user software for crowdsourcing uh, where people explored the uh, different uh, uh, proteins and tried to predict uh, how they would uh, dock, how they would connect. So uh, it's possible to teach people uh, to be familiar, intuitively familiar with molecules. Uh, there are several examples uh, in science fiction uh, uh, about how people can work with molecules uh, and how they can design them. Uh, there's one story uh, in uh, 
uh, in Frank Herbert's uh, Dune, uh, there is uh, a exploration of uh, chemistry, including simplified chemistry in VR uh, called Autoverse uh, in Permutation City by Greg Egan. And there's of course the Diamond Age uh, by uh, Stevenson where uh, there is uh, work carried out uh, in a place called Design Works, Merkel Hall, named after Ralph Merkel. And um, it's explored how people work there in virtual reality designing uh, advanced molecular machines. So uh, that is, I think, um, that can lead, um, if you give people VR uh, to explore uh, uh, the space of possible molecules, uh, that leads to goal-free education, uh, which uh, can be much more effective according to things like cognitive law theory, for example. And um, uh, it's not um, uh, accidental that um, playing with, um, uh, playing with construct, uh, construction sets uh, such as Tinker Toys, Lego, etc., cetera, uh, is uh, really um, so important and so popular. Uh, people uh, have been thinking about uh, like uh, what uh, play approaches, what play strategies uh, are good for education. And um, uh, time and time again, we see that things like uh, Lego, like Minecraft, they're very good because they, op they allow open-ended exploration. So for this reason, I think that uh, once we have uh, software for design, which allows you to explore the uh, infinite possibilities uh, that can be done in uh, the chemical world, uh, then you would have more breakthroughs and more people familiar with how chemistry works. Because uh, yes, it's possible to design something uh, using existing tools uh, for free design, three dimensional uh, design and for uh, computer aided design, but uh, it's impossible to design something if you don't know what it is. Unless, of course, you have a sandbox, such as uh, uh, Minecraft or hopefully NanoLab. So that's what I think uh, this approach brings uh, to the table. Also, I think there is uh, like two main directions, two main vectors. First one uh, is experiential, uh, is uh, try and see. And another one is uh, completely like conceptual from concept concepts and uh, these two approaches can be combined. Uh, uh, the first one is a question of tries, number of tries, number of attempts and, and intuition. Uh, and uh, it needs, uh, I think it needs a, a crowdsourcing community uh, that crowdsource the ideas, crowdsource the performances of different parts. Uh, so it can be, uh, can be like build of, uh, uh, from one another on top of another uh, and uh, like like uh, combustion engines were uh, became insanely effective and can compete with hybrid uh, vehicles uh, last for last like maybe 15 years 20 years and the combustion engines we know for for like 20 200 years almost so it, it is uh, really the question of, of uh, the perfection is not yet achieved in in terms of tools in terms of uh, social networking tools for uh, uh, nano engineers and and molecular manipulation so i think the lego of uh, uh, the lego for uh molecular manipulation, uh, individual atom manipulation and, and um, complex molecule uh, manipulation are up are still to come. You know? So it, it's still the, the, the road ahead uh, for, for both of these uh, uh, main direction, main vectors of development. Alexey, uh, I want uh, to show a small clip uh, showing uh, how it works, uh, uh, the system that we have. Are you able to do it? Yeah, you will see it now. So the hands that you see are uh, actual users' hands that are tracked uh, using uh, leap motion. And uh, uh, current generation of virtual reality helmets such as Oculus Quest 2 
uh, have this hand tracking built in. Uh, so what we can have in the near future uh, is a software that runs on a portable VR helmet, no connection to PC required, and uh, it would have hand tracking and the cost uh, for Oculus Quest 2 is just uh, $300. So people can have that and then they can go into this virtual reality and build uh, uh, complicated uh, structures such as what you see here. And of course, uh, a lot of improvements are possible in terms of visualization, uh, in terms of uh, how you um, can uh, work in a big uh, workspace. Uh, so you can potentially move around uh, and, uh, and so on. So that's uh, uh, the direction I think uh, we should uh, go to. Yeah. Just wanted to share this briefly. Well, thank you, Daniela. Thank you, participants. Uh, uh, there's a request from uh, Boston Nanotechnology Study Group to share our presentation, maybe give us some short talk about it. Uh, I think it was useful. Uh, and uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. See you next time. Yes, and uh, just to remind everyone that, yes, uh, today is Eric Vexler's 66th birthday. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, write uh, about that post on Facebook uh, and let's uh, celebrate because I think that uh, has, he has been and will be extremely important in uh, helping humanity uh, transition to the next uh, technological level. I have a, I have a question. If, um, <clears throat> um, how, how likely is it that if somebody had an idea of how to potentially um, produce nanomaterials and possibly nanomachines at a large scale in a way that's, that's energy of more energy efficient and that um, and that is programmable. How long do you think that would take to implement with with technology that currently exists? Uh, my guess would be uh, a decade or two additionally. Uh, we don't know how complicated the system design is, but uh, we can uh, we can. Um, look at benchmarks such as, for example, International uh, Thermonuclear Reactor Project or large projects in uh, aerospace uh, field. Uh, so it takes uh, human engineers uh, a decade uh, to design something really complicated. And uh, it can be that first uh, versions of programmable matter uh, can be uh, just as complicated. So it can be like, 10 years or maybe 20 years. Uh, but of course that can change uh, depending on the amount of resources it can take much longer and potentially maybe done uh, quickly uh, like in Manhattan project uh, just in five years if uh, we see that it's really important and if we really focus uh, all the society's resources on that. Okay, um, I'd like to stay in touch. I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to send you um, some info if you want. Yes, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, sorry for this long delays from my part. And uh, see you next time. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.